enjoy this conversation, and we are certainly welcome to contribute to it even before we actually get started. To do so, all you have to do is go ahead and comment in or add to the question box on the right-hand side of your screen or into the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we can go ahead and incorporate any thoughts that you may have. That being said, it's an exciting week here at Joffe because we have a number of things going on. Yesterday, I actually was in New York talking with a group of schools and businesses, and uh, there were several folks that we'll talk with you about a little bit throughout today's conversation that just fit the, the mold for having unique challenges when it comes to safety and particularly reunification. So we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, but perhaps more exciting, at least for the Western states, we have the ShakeOut coming up next week. Um, the ShakeOut is a drill that is done every year, and it's typically done somewhere in the middle of October. Um, this year it's going to be on October 15th at 10.15 a.m., and that is actually going to be the case regardless of what time zone you're in. So it'll be 10.15 on 10.15, whether you're in Pacific Central or any other time zone. We certainly invite you to participate. In, in fact, over the course of the next couple of minutes, Mark and I will talk a little bit about some of the schools and businesses that we'll be working with on the ShakeOut. So to get started, Mark, have you uh, had the opportunity to participate in ShakeOut drills before? Hi, Chris. Good morning. Uh, and yes, I have participated in several ShakeOut drills over the years, both as a facilitator of them and as a participant. And it's one of these things that, that uh, I really applaud the state of California and the various safety agencies for encouraging people to do. And um, I certainly have experienced uh, people's reactions like, oh, why are we doing this? And we're sitting under desks and we're sitting under tables and it all feels a little bit foolish. If you've never experienced an actual earthquake, it probably does seem like an exercise in silliness to some people, but it's actually a very serious topic. And practicing, um, we're going to talk today about why it's important to practice with reunification, but practicing with all of your school safety is really critical to getting it right in an actual emergency. And um, knowing what to do in an earthquake uh, is as important as knowing what to do in any other uh, emergency. And so the shakeout allows us to remember that when the earth starts moving, we should drop cover and hold on under a sturdy surface and get away from uh, windows and other things that can fall because that's what's going to keep us safe. Many, many more people are injured in the initial moments of an earthquake because they panic and run than if they were to do what the shakeout teaches us. So um, yes, I participated and I'm a big proponent. Awesome. And in fact, you, you, that was a good point, Mark. We, you, one of the things that I oftentimes find myself asking or, or questioning or even just talking about is that we prepare for and we do these, these earthquake drills and you know, shakeout day is all about earthquakes of course, but the practices and the steps that we take during an earthquake aren't too dissimilar from the practices and the steps that we take during any other emergency. So the basic concept of do something and then get out of the building is, is something that for the most part is uh, in fact necessary in any of the other emergency types that we practice for. So of course in fire, the do something is really pull the fire alarm and then get out. Um, well, in a lockdown, the do something is a little bit more extended. It's actually locked down, or if it's a secure campus or whatever the case may be, there may be some different steps that go along at the beginning of the process. But ultimately, the act of having to communicate to your entire student and staff and faculty bodies is, is difficult and is challenging in, in a number of different ways based on the intricacies and nuances of your campus. And then to layer onto that to try and tell them to do something like get out of the building uh, allows you to prepare for any of those other types of emergencies. So uh, that, that's a good point. Although certainly ShakeOut Day is all about earthquakes, it's, there are dividends that it pays that go far above and beyond just those. Um, so with that, I think let's go ahead and get started here. We are excited again to have each and every one of you on the line with us and can't believe how incredible these webinars have been just in terms of how much we've been able to learn about each of you and how much you've been willing to share with us. So I want to take just a quick second to say thank you not only for being here but for being so active and engaged and helping us really understand who you are so that ultimately we can provide and, and share content that makes sense for you. Today we're going to be talking about reunification in the school setting and the concept of reunification is one that theoretically should be very simple. Put the kids back with the parents. However, in emergencies and frankly even at dismissal sometimes on a regular day, reunification can be incredibly difficult and incredibly complex and have policies and laws and all sorts of other compliance issues that go along with it above and beyond the basic logistics of just putting kid A back with parent A and making sure everybody gets to go home. 
before we jump in, I'll share with you just a quick bit. Uh, my name is Chris, and I am the founder and CEO of Jaffe Emergency Services. And Jaffe is a company that started as a CPR and first aid training company and event safety company. And the more we grew and the more we had opportunity to work with schools, the more people said, hey, can you help us with this? And so we organically created this school safety team. And that's the team that you're talking with today. Mark's actually the leader of that team. And so you'll hear from him in just a moment. But the team focuses on schools nationwide, from LA to New York to Boston to San Francisco. And we love the work that we get to do because every school is so incredibly uniquely different from the last. And so again, we, we can't tell you how much we appreciate you being on the line with us. Um, we've shared throughout this conversation and throughout this webinar series that your questions are incredibly important to us in making sure that we hear them and we're able to answer them is just one of the things that keeps us going on these webinars. And so we'd like to ask that if you do have any questions throughout the webinar today, whether they're unique to your school or challenges that you find or think that other folks might find at a number of different schools, please feel free to share those with us. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mark and welcome Mark. Chris, uh, thank you very much and welcome everybody uh, to our topic today, reunification in schools. Uh, and as Chris mentioned, um, one of the many hats that I wear at Jaffe is uh, overseeing our safety consultants' efforts. Uh, my formal title is I'm the Director of Employee Development and Special Operations, but I do a little bit of uh, everything at Jaffe, uh, including uh, event safety work, I'm a BLS instructor, and I do quite a bit of work with our other consultants in terms of helping schools get from where they are to where they want to be when it comes to safety and preparedness. Uh, so our topic this morning, reunification in schools, is meant to address one of the, to my mind, most critical components of a successful uh, safety and preparation plan, and yet one that is often, if not overlooked, um, not as well uh, planned out uh, as many of the other efforts. And, and to me, one of the ironies of that is every single day, uh, schools do reunification. Every day, uh, students are dismissed. Uh, and put back with their families uh, in uh, sometimes a highly structured way and otherwise a very informal way, but it happens every day. So in essence, this is a part of your uh, emergency plan that should be finely honed uh, in a well-oiled uh, machine, and yet I find this is one that perhaps because it happens every day, people forget to be intentional about. So we're going to talk about that. Um, just to put this into the context of the overall emergency plan, when we work with schools, we generally uh, identify a number of what we call core teams and reunification is one of those core teams and just to lay out the others very briefly for you. Uh, at the top of the process you typically have your command team or your emergency operations center team. Uh, these are typically your um, higher level administrators and other key stakeholders at the school who have uh, the job of dealing with both the internal and external uh, parts of the emergency. You've got your uh, search and rescue team, which is tasked with uh, searching the facility following an emergency to make sure that people uh, have gotten safely out, and if they haven't, uh, finding a way to get them out if they can safely do so. You have your first aid team, which is tasked with uh, helping those who are ill and injured. Uh, you have your attendance team, uh, which is uh, charged with keeping track of uh, who is where and who is missing. Uh, you've got your long-range care team, which is tasked with dealing with folks if we have to actually hunker down and stay on campus for a while. And then you've got your reunification team, and your reunification team is that group of individuals who are charged with safely putting children back with their parents. Um, so that's how reunification fits into a larger picture when it comes to safety teams, and that's the team we're going to focus on today. So in terms of our objectives for this morning, you'll forgive me for actually reading these to you. Uh, but we want to identify the role reunification plays in school-based emergencies. We're going to discuss how to make uh, this an effective part of your emergency planning. We're going to highlight common challenges reunification teams uh, and processes face. And finally, we're going to talk about creating ownership among parents in the process. Uh, Chris invited you to uh, ask questions along the way, and I, would, I want to reiterate that. I believe you have the ability to ask questions in the chat box, uh, which Chris and I will be able to see. Uh, also, uh, as we're moving through this morning, we actually have three separate questions we're going to ask for your input uh, on intentionally, but if the other things come up uh, before that, then just at any point, ask that question and we'll address it for you. 
So let's start by kind of putting ourselves in a mindset about this whole idea of reunification. What does this mean? Um, it sort of uh, sounds obvious, but it's true that uh, when parents drop their children off at school, they want and expect to know that they are going to be safe. Um, when parents want to be reunited with their children, they don't want any obstacles in order to make that happen, whether that's on a regular day or certainly in an emergency. And so one of the challenges that we face and one of the uh, efforts that we have to undertake uh, is how do we balance these two things? How do we give parents that sense of confidence? and uh, not make them feel like there are obstacles to retrieving, retrieving their children's emergency, and at the same time ensure that they are able to participate in an orderly and thoughtful process we've created. Um, because uh, one of the things we want them to remember is that we're concerned with the safety of their child and every other child, and we want to make sure that we uh, handle each student the same level of consideration. Uh, and we can empathize with our parents and recognize that their concern at that point is probably only their child. Uh, but we need to also do what we can to help them remember that our concern is with not just their child, but with all the children in the school. So why do we need this process? Why do we even need a reunification team? Again, it comes back to safety and security is what it boils down to. Um, when emergencies happen on campuses, we want to make sure that all the students and all the adults are safe. We want to make sure that they're accounted for. Um, and as is almost human nature, when we get into emergency situations, our adrenaline tends to uh, jump up. Uh, our mind tends to uh, either slow way, way down and we're incapable of making decisions or it tends to want to speed up and we want to try and make decisions too quickly. And so for all those reasons, you want to make sure that you have a thoughtful process that is understood and practiced so that you can rely on that, practice, that process uh, to help carry you through. Um, and for reunification specifically, the whole point of this is to make sure that we can effectively and safely put students back with their families uh, in a way that we can keep track of who's going where and under what circumstances. So just to put, uh, let's sort of just describe reunification in its simplest form and also frankly as if nothing was a problem whatsoever. Uh, so reunification on paper anyways, is a parent says, hey, I'm looking for my student, John Smith. Uh, the school says, great, Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith. Um, I see that that is who you are. We've checked your identity. You're on this list. Um, your student is right over here. We hand the student to you, and we document the fact that we handed them to you, and we're done. So that sounds very neat and tidy. Uh, and on paper, that's exactly what reunification is really all about. And as we'll discuss in the next several minutes, uh, that is really the goal that we're aiming for is exactly that level of neat and tidiness, but is um, we may not be able to get there, or some schools may not be able to get there even on a regular basis, let alone in an emergency basis. So here's the first of three questions that I have for you, and I would uh, welcome your feedback. Um, if you all have an active reunification team as a part of your emergency plan, if you could indicate that you do, and if you do not have uh, an active team, if you could indicate that you don't, and we'll go ahead and just give you a minute to answer that question, and then we will forge ahead. Okay, why don't we go ahead and close the poll. All right, so uh, we've got, uh, it looks like about 60% of you all have a plan. That's great, and about 40% do, uh, do not, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, Chris, if you, I'm going to ask you to jump in here for just a quick second. In terms of our experience working with uh, schools in the first year of working with them on our safety planning, 
What's been your experience in terms of the number of schools that have some sort of a reunification team identified when we actually start working with them? That's a good question, Marco. And I'll say what's interesting about this is that I find that most of our schools have a pretty set reunification process in place, and what they call it is dismissal. And so for some of you that are thinking, well, I don't necessarily have a reunification process in place, if you've got a younger audience, and I would say elementary or middle school is probably the best uh, way to split that and, and determine whether or not you actually have one in place already, you probably are doing reunification at the end of every day. And you're just calling it dismissal because that's what it is to you. The core components that go along with, with reunification are not different when we're doing our placements or when we're when we're trying to figure out how to get rid of students post earthquake or fire or hurricane or whatever it is then they are on a regular day-to-day -day basis it's our goal and our responsibility to make sure that the right kids go home with the right parents or the right people whether they're parents or guardians or babysitters or nannies or anything else um, so it, it may be that you actually do have a program in place and it just is, is labeled a little bit differently or thought of a little bit differently now the place where I find that most schools actually don't have a reunification plan in place when we first start working with them are those high schools or those middle and high schools where there's not such a formal reunification or dismissal process that involves a number of if any staff or faculty members but instead they just sort of let the kids get on the buses and get out of there. And for those environments I in general would say that the majority of those schools especially in our first year actually don't have a reunification plan in place. And like Mark said, and like we'll continue to talk about throughout today's conversation, not having a reunification plan in place is perhaps the most dangerous uh, lack of preparedness that there is on a school campus. And I don't necessarily mean dangerous as in physical or uh, emotional or any other type of harm that could be caused, but I mean dangerous in terms of liability and in terms of how we're going to react and how we're going to actually get these students reunited or put back together with their families. So uh, if you don't have a reunification plan in place today, I'll challenge you to create one over the course of the next 60 days. And I know I tend to be a speaker with a lot of homework about uh, some of the things that we talk about, but this is perhaps the most important, uh, of at least of the things that we've talked about thus far. Great. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. All right, so let's forge ahead, and I want to talk a little bit about mindset again. So first of all, we talked about the mindset of our parents and what they expect of, of schools. Now let's talk about the mindset or the uh, demeanor of somebody who I think you want on your reunification team. When uh, you're identifying who should be a participant in a, any one of the teams that you have in your safety plan, uh, depending on how large or small your school is, uh, sometimes that has an impact on who gets assigned to what team. Uh, sometimes it's who's interested in serving on a team. Uh, sometimes you just have to say, this is how many people we have and this is how many teams we have and we're just going to do the best we can. Uh, sometimes people are voluntold how to uh, be in a particular team. Uh, but if you have the opportunity uh, to uh, put people into teams based in large measure on their skill set and their mindset, then when it comes to people for reunification, uh, I would suggest that you have people who have some of the traits that you are seeing on the screen right now, which is having that calm and confident manner, not easily being rattled by upset people or situation, detail-oriented and process-oriented, and ideally familiar with and to the students. And this is especially true for our younger students, uh, because in an emergency situation, any age student can become uh, concerned and emotional just like their parents can. Uh, but with our younger students in particular, the adult that is trying to help them is already known to them. That tends to go a long way towards everyone staying calm. Uh, but reunification is about taking in a lot of information simultaneously from a lot of very anxious people, conveying that information in a thoughtful uh, way so that your team members can help identify the stu student you're looking for, ensuring that we're putting the right student with the right parent, and doing so in a way that doesn't gum up the works either literally or figuratively. So uh, if you have the chance, these are some of the, the traits that I think you want to be looking for, people who make up your reunification team. So what are some challenges when it comes to reunification? Um, and uh, one of the ways that I try and look at this is uh, if, there's, if there's very little difference between how you actually uh, dismiss students, to use that uh, term, or reunify students, 
uh, on a daily basis versus your plan to do it in an emergency, then I think you've got a lot less uh, to be concerned about. If, however, uh, the way that you uh, handle putting students back with their parents on a daily basis is remarkably different from how you would do it in an emergency or if you don't have a plan for how you would do it in an emergency, that's a really big challenge. Um, so that variance between normal and emergency, the, the, the degree to which we can uh, lessen that variance or shrink that variance, uh, the better off we're going to be. Another challenge we find uh, routinely when it comes to this particular topic is uh, parents, guardians, or other family members who are not on the list. And when I say the list, um, presumably most of you, especially again with younger students, have some sort of a documentation about who is uh, authorized uh, by the family to pick up a student. And often that is one or more parents. It uh, routinely includes uh, grandparents, sometimes older siblings. It may include aunts and uncles. It may even include trusted family members. But there's somewhere in writing that says, this adult can pick up this child under what circumstances. Uh, but in an emergency situation, sometimes the people who are able to pick up the, uh, authorized to pick up the student are not able to pick up the student. So how are you going to deal with people who are not on the list? Um, Keeping students and families appropriately separated. Uh, when we practice this with schools, uh, one of the best practices that we advise is that the students are uh, not in visual uh, proximity um, or literal proximity to where the pickup area is, that they are actually uh, kept in a safe area. Uh, and then once they, uh, their parent or uh, adult pickup person is identified, then a school official goes and gets the student, puts them back with the parents. So we keep the parents on the perimeter. Uh, you keep the students on the interior. Uh, when uh, you have, uh, when you're unable to do that, then you run the great risk of parents just basically freelancing and students freelancing and everyone running towards each other. And it doesn't work out in a particularly good way. And that goes back to the fact that now we can't account for who's been uh, let go and who hasn't. And uh, it doesn't take. Uh, many news stories to remind you that one of the first and most challenging aspects of an emergency is understanding where our loved ones are. And that's why we stress this so much is this process because that, that way even if it can seem challenging for our parents or for our students, in doing this we are ensuring that we can account for everybody which is ultimately what the parents are going to hold uh, schools accountable for. And then the other thing uh, is the uh, issue that a lot of our schools face, at least the ones we work with, with traffic flow and traffic jams and how do you manage not just the people but the vehicles that they're driving. Uh, so those are that's another key uh, area to be aware of. And now we've got our second poll for you um, to help get some more input. And so when it comes to reunification uh, or dismissal, uh, what's your biggest challenge? Um, so your process, the execution of the process, the logistics of the school, and that could include the layout um, or uh, the neighborhood you're in or something else. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and uh, take a minute to answer that question, that would be great. While you go ahead and answer that, question, if your CUP or conditional use permit or whatever agreement that you have with the city is part of your challenge with reunification, you can list that as other and then feel free to share the specifics that go along with that. One of the things that I find with many of the schools that we work with is that post major disaster, they could practice and, and actually enact their reunification process. but during a regular drill or during a moulage drill, even the full-scale drill that we run every year with most of our schools, the reunification process actually is very difficult to run because there's so much pressure on keeping traffic down and keeping car counts down and keeping parents out or in or whatever the case may be. So if the CUP or if there are other sort of external barriers that are between you and practicing or conducting reunification, just go ahead and list that as other. And again, go ahead and share the specifics of, of those circumstances with us either in the question or chat panel there on the right-hand side of your screen. Thanks very much for that, Chris. And yeah, um, and it goes back to that first point I made under challenges is if you do have those circumstances, think about uh, the process you use on a daily basis, which is meant to minimize traffic impact uh, to your neighbors. Uh, think, is there a way that we can also make this our reunification process an emergency? And if, if the 
the to the greater degree that you can, the better off you're going to be. Not just because uh, it will help avoid upsetting the neighbors, but also it's something that you will have practiced much more so that when you actually have to implement an emergency, you know exactly what to do. All right, why don't we go ahead and close the poll, see what we found out. <laughs> All right, so we have, uh, in this second poll, we have absolute uh, consistency. Every one of you said that the logistics at the school are your greatest challenge when it comes to your reunification process. Uh, and so uh, I'm not sure uh, if for some of you if that means uh, the layout of the school um, or if it's uh, something related to that, but uh, it, it sounds like for everyone who's with us today that's their biggest challenge. So thank you for sharing that with us. All right. So let's talk about a couple things. We talked about some challenges, um, and you identified logistics as your biggest challenge. Let's talk for a little bit here about policy and practice issues. Um, and it, this is sort of, in a way, this slide is restating just a little bit what we've already talked about, but uh, we're going to go ahead and do that anyways. Um, one of the things that parents are going to absolutely hold the school accountable for is that uh, the people who are picking up the students, whether it's on a regular day or definitely an emergency, are authorized to do so. And uh, you know that that can sometimes be a lot more challenging than we'd like it to be. Uh, and in daily occurrences, that may have something to do with whether or not there's a non-custodial parent who's interested in picking up the student and that didn't get cleared with the school, or a well-meaning grandparent who's coming to pick up uh, their grandchild for an after-school adventure and mom or dad knew about it, but no one told the school. Um, but it's the school's absolute uh, responsibility to make sure that when that student is handed off to an adult and leaves the school, that that adult is authorized to take that student away. And emergency situations just impact this and they magnify that. Uh, and so having that sound process uh, should also anticipate likely uh, issues and then tries to account for them. So f for instance, sticking with this idea for a second, um, when you're crafting your reunification policies and your practices, um, thinking about how, you know, or anticipating the fact that you will absolutely have somebody come by who is interested in picking up a student who is not on the list and having a plan for that so that you don't have to deal with it in an actual emergency is a really, really good way to think through a sound practice or sound policy. And then also scenario is a planning tool. Um, when we're working with schools uh, on putting a reunification process together and they don't have one existing already, um, sometimes that's almost easier than if they do have one. Uh, but regardless, I'd like to start with what is the ideal process if you didn't have to worry about neighborhood impacts, if you didn't have to worry about people not playing by the rules, if you didn't have to worry about people's emotions and things like that, what would be the ideal process that you would have in your reunification process? And then once you identify that and, and perhaps write it down, then picture and say out loud what is the worst possible scenario? What would happen if everything was just utter chaos and no one played by the rules and everybody was emotional and we had a huge traffic jam and the students started running towards the parents and the parents started running towards the students. So picture sort of the worst possible outcome. Now talk through both of those things, what is perfect and, and what is anything but that, and then see how can we craft a, a viable plan, one that actually can work, uh, that will begin to shrink the gap between that ideal and that worst, and then um, go from there, build on that. Um, because we want to avoid worst, and I think very often you can't really have ideal, so what, what's the smallest amount of difference we can create, or the smallest amount of space we can create between those two things? And if you've never done this kind of scenario uh, planning, I would encourage you to do that, not just for reunification, but, but honestly, you could use this approach for any aspect of your emergency plan or, candidly, any aspect of your um, planning for anything you're doing at school. Uh, picture yourself uh, getting ready to introduce a new course into uh, your curriculum. What would it look like if the course was uh, implemented with no problems whatsoever, everybody embraced it? What would it look like if there was total chaos, or, you know, and, concern about that. So you can use this ideal and then uh, worst possible actual concept in your daily planning as well as your emergency planning, but definitely use it in your emergency planning. So 
So what are some absolute essentials when it comes to reunification? Uh, simple is better. Um, I find that uh, when it comes to uh, things that involve humans and their emotions, uh, especially in emergency situations, the fewer things that we have to keep track of, the better. Uh, and so as simple as you can make it is a better process. Um, and so what is basically the simplest thing we can think of when it comes to reunification? You need a list of your students and you need to make sure it's up to date. Um, you need a list of authorized parents and family members and you need a way to document the release of that student to those people and that includes who did you hand the student off to, when did you do that, and then who actually made the exchange. So taking into account uh, what person picked up the student, what date and time did that happen, and who was the school staff member who facilitated that exchange. That's pretty simple, um, but that's really what it boils down to. Um, a couple other things uh, that will help, uh, I think, that are essentials and will help you with a good process. Uh, avoid freelance driving. So in other words, there should be a plan for traffic flow. Uh, if people are allowed to just go where they want, uh, you have an unsafe situation on your hands on multiple levels, not the least of which people uh, being hit by moving vehicles. Uh, so think through your traffic plan. And this, again, goes back to the idea that if at all possible uh, to make your reunification and emergency handoff as closely uh, as close to your daily handoff, the better. Um, if at all possible, keep parents in their cars. Uh, this does two things for you, at least. One, it lets you know where those parents are, and it helps keep traffic moving, uh, and it, it gives them a job, which is stay in the car and wait for the student. Um, if we allow them to get out of their cars, they're going to leave their cars wherever they want to. If we got allow them to get out of their cars, they may go searching for their student. And now not only do we have a parent on the loose looking for their kid, but now we have a car that's blocking the other car. So keep them in the car, uh, if at all possible. Uh, if you can't keep them in the car because your situation doesn't allow for that, then have a designated parking spot where parents go and place their vehicles and then come to a designated check-in, check-out table that, again, uh, creates an intentional barrier, a visual barrier and a little bar barrier uh, between them and their student. Uh, the person who's checking the parent's ID should not be the one going and getting the student. You always want to have a staff member uh, who is able to address parents and um, continue to uh, engage them in conversation while this process is happening. And we already talked about the fact that if there's any way to keep a visual distance between the students and the parents, that is really, really helpful. This is an example checkout uh, sheet. Uh, it's very, very simple the student's name, the parent's name, who checked them out and what time. Uh, the only thing you might want to add here is what date, or although you could write the date on uh, somewhere else on the sheet. Um, my guess is that many of you have something that's not totally dissimilar to this. Some of you might have something that's much more involved in this. Uh, there are other variables that you could put on your checkout sheet, and that could include the student's grade, the student's age. Um, things like that. Uh, there are uh, ways that you're uh, you might choose to include what uh, form of ID was checked or what have you. But going back to this notion of simple is better, especially if you're just starting out, as long as we can go back later on and figure out what the name of the student was, who that parent was, or other guardian, who at the school released them and when that happened, we can probably con reconstruct a fairly effective understanding of what happened that day. And here's an example authorization form. Again, you put your student's name at the top, um, the name of who is authorized to pick up this student, what the relationship to that student is, and any restrictions that might be in place. So let's say you've got a mom or a dad um, or uh, a grandparent, and uh, so you've got three people on the list. Their relationship to the student is parent, parent, and grandparent. And mom or dad can pick up the student on any day without any restrictions. Uh, let's say the grandparent is um, only able to pick up uh, with a previous phone call or only able to pick up on Fridays. Or let's say there's a carpool situation and so uh, the name of the adult is, uh, the adult's not related to the student, but they have a relationship of being a carpool driver and maybe the restriction there is not in an emergency situation. So again, pretty simple. Uh, student's name, uh, name of the adult, what the relationship of that adult is to the student, and what restrictions, if any, are placed on when they can pick that student up. Here's our third poll for you for this morning. 
Um, we'll go ahead and open this up now. Uh, and this goes back to a question we asked you a little bit earlier and one of the things we asked you to anticipate, which is what happens, and this isn't an if, this is a when. Um, I can assure you based on uh, experience working with schools. You have a family member who shows up to claim uh, the student, but they're not on the improved pickup list. Uh, if you were faced this situation in an emergency and you didn't already have a plan in place, what would you all do? So go ahead and take a moment to answer that question for us. And Chris, while we've got our folks answering the poll, I was wondering if maybe you, you could think of a, a specific example from a school we worked with where they faced this and uh, one of, what was one of the outcomes they came to. Because I know this happens. Uh, this is a common thing in an emergency. For me, in working with schools on reunification plans, this is one of the things that I want them to anticipate and have a game plan for. Uh, right after they decide how they're going to document, uh, this is probably the very next thing I want them to work on. Absolutely. And in fact, I, I can share that I've actually seen schools do each of the three options here, release the student, contact a parent for permission, um, wait and just say that student is not going to be released until somebody on the list shows up. But I've also seen schools throw their hands up in the air and go, I don't know. And so far in looking at some of the responses that are coming in on the poll, it looks like a lot of you are thinking contact the parent to seek permission. And I'll, I'll challenge you a little bit with this to say that one of the schools that I saw, and I'll, I'll leave the school nameless for the time being, it was, it was an elementary school, so some context around it. It was an elementary school in Southern California, and we were doing a moulage drill, which is that annual full-scale drill where schools have an opportunity to test all of the systems that we have implemented throughout the year and throughout the summer and everything else. And during the drill, a parent showed up, and this was actually a scripted part of the drill, so we had a parent show up that was not on the emergency card. And the school went, well, I, I don't know what to do. Can I release the child? And I said, all right, well, let's talk it through. And the command center came together and they said, all right, well, we're going to contact the other parent because this particular one was not on the emergency card and we're going to ask for permission. And some of you might be going, well, that's the right thing to do. And they got verbal permission over the phone. And some of you might be thinking, that's the right thing to do. The challenge that they then had was that they got the verbal permission and that parent still showed up a little while later in the drill. Now, mind you, this was all scripted, so no child or no school liability or insurance or anything else was ever in jeopardy, but it raised an interesting question, and that is how can we actually seek permission, and what methods do we need to or should we employ in order to get the approval from one parent or somebody else on the emergency card? And what we found is that an email or other electronic or written means of communication is best because what that allows us to do is then say to that parent that shows up and, and again in this case it was dad who had shown up. Dad said I'm not on the emergency card but this is my child. Mom was the one who was called and mom said alright go ahead and release and then it was mom that showed up later and said hey can I pick up my child. And what an email or other type of written authorization does is it allows us to really say to mom well here's where you said it was okay and we were able to verify your identity through your email address and the phone conversation that we had with you. I find that this also comes up a lot and is coming up more and more in metropolitan areas with various rideshare services. And there are services like Lyft or Hop, Skip and Jump or Uber, any of these services where essentially a child is being picked up by somebody who's not on the list because you can't just list Uber uh, under the emergency contacts or authorized to pick up uh, sections on your emergency cards. It just doesn't work that way. And so you end up with somebody, and we'll call somebody uh, Timmy Jones, who has shown up and said, I'm ready to pick up this child, and they're not on the emergency card. And the same thing has to come into question. Well, what type of authorization do we need to get, and can we get a blanket authorization? And if that's a challenge that you're experiencing, uh, stay with us on this webinar series, because that's actually coming up a little bit later on in the year. However, the more that this happens, the more we really have to call into question the type of approval and release process that is acceptable. And in general, best practice says some type of written authorization is best. If you can get the parent to also send you some type of proof of identity, that's even better. So put differently, if a parent emails you and says, yes, Timmy Jones can pick up my child, or yes, dad can pick up the child, and his name is X, Y, and Z, 
and the parent scans a copy of their driver's license or other type of identification, now we've really covered our bases because we've truly verified the identity and we've gone ahead and gotten the written authorization. Now, does that mean that we couldn't be wrong or does that mean that we couldn't be held liable if there was a mistake made? Absolutely not. And we're not lawyers and it's not our place to say what exactly the liability looks like or, or what the compliance metrics or areas look like. But in general, if you've taken those steps, you're going to be in a pretty good place. And if you've established a policy in advance and you've established that with either a consultant or amongst yourselves and then you've allowed it to be sort of run through your legal team, then you're going to be in a pretty good place, especially if, of course, your legal team has signed off on it. Now, again, if you are one of the types of schools that says, you know what, we're just going to put our hands down and we're going to say, or our foot down, I suppose, and we're going to say nobody can pick up this child unless somebody on the list shows up, that begs some interesting questions as well, because in California and or anywhere where, where we look at earthquakes and frankly on the East Coast where we look at severe weather that may block bridges and roads and tunnels and things like that, it is possible that somebody on the emergency card truly cannot physically get to the school. And so the next question to ask yourself then is, well, what do you do at the end of that three-day period? At the end of that three days where we've prepared for and we've planned for and we're ready to retain all the students that we have, if we're still sitting with a few students or maybe even more that haven't yet been picked up, well, then what do we do? And the question then really leads us to how do we restore education? How do we find housing and manage keeping these kids happy and healthy and safe over the course of the next X number of days until we can get somebody on the list there? Now, you increase the, the time frame or, or you, you, you put some more pressure on the timeline when you say somebody on the list might, must come because in order for that to work, somebody on the list has to physically be able to get there quickly enough for everybody else to go home. So I share that just so that it, it really is a reminder of one of the challenges that goes along with this and, and frankly and unfortunately, uh, these natural disasters that impact an entire region are more susceptible to this than a human created disaster say where more often than not it's just that one specific school or neighborhood or area and in those situations more often than not we're able to bus students to a place where we can provide reunification or, or set up reunification and so for the most part so long as everybody from the adult community in the neighborhood is safe and, and well somebody can show up but in those natural disasters it is a question that you then have to really be prepared to answer because unfortunately you may have to answer it so um, it looks like the bulk of you have said you'd contact a parent to seek permission and actually it looks like 100% of you have said that, yep. which is excellent. Um, that certainly is, is a good option and I'll, I would challenge you to evaluate whether or not you have a policy in place that, that really dictates or prescribes what type of authorization or permission you really need to go out and get. Thanks, Chris. That's really helpful to share that. And then the, uh, thing I, the one thing I would add at this point is um, that uh, your sort of next what is it in your planning would be uh, if you contact the parents and you're unable to reach them uh, for whatever reason, uh, what's the next step beyond that? So if uh, we call mom or dad or text mom or dad or whoever it is that we're trying to reach uh, and then we can't get a hold of them, uh, what's our process for uh, next? So are we going to try again? Are we going to uh, see if the person who wants to pick up the student can reach the parent uh, on our behalf and then connect the two? Uh, but uh, there's, we need to definitely make sure that you think about what happens when you cannot reach that person you sought uh, permission from. I want to talk for just a second about engaging parents um, because uh, this, this is, a, you know, like we already identified their expectations of us, but let's talk about how they can make this a better process. Uh, first and foremost, uh, if uh, appropriate, um, and I believe it is appropriate, find ways to engage your parents in developing not only your reunification process, but really all aspects of your emergency plan. I find that if you're able to uh, get parents involved in the planning process, it creates a sense of ownership on their part, uh, and also uh, it uh, helps them to be uh, ambassadors for your process with other parents. So that if uh, they're having a conversation with each other and they say, you know, I'm really frustrated with this process that the school makes us go through uh, for the student. If the parents had a chance to become a part of that planning process, they can articulate why the process exists uh, and uh, be a spokesperson on behalf of the school. Um, another thing that I would suggest uh, is have a role reversal day where you actually have parents who have to hand off the students to the school staff uh, and use the same 
basic mechanisms that you would use for reunifying a student with the parents and just flip it so that the parent is reunifying the student with the school. Uh, and some of the same challenges can be faced in terms of who's authorized and how do we document and things like that. Again, it engages the parent in the process and helps them look at it from a very different lens because they're going to generally come from one lens only, which is I want my student, I want them now. Uh, and if we can get them to look at this from a different perspective, that helps quite a bit. Uh, and then uh, those same parents who you uh, encourage to help with the planning process, uh, make them your um, intentional ambassadors and uh, help them, ask them to help spread the word about why this process is so important. Uh, a few training tips. Uh, some of these we already talked about. Um, others are, you know, so it's a, re uh, a reiteration. Others are some new ones. Um, once you've identified that best possible situation and that worst possible situation and you're ready to start talking about that, that's really sort of a tabletop level of exercise. So in other words, put your plan in place, have your plan articulated on paper, and then talk through the whole process, but do so sitting around a table where you can look at each other. Um, I find that uh, this is a great next step once you get through the initial planning because it allows you to start and stop as much as you want and uh, it, it tends to free up the mind a little bit and not get stuck in a litter of physical space or something like that. So pull your plan out, sit around a table and just literally talk through from start to finish. Okay, we had an earthquake and uh, we've identified where the students are safe and now the parents are starting to arrive to reunify and literally just talk through the process. And you can actually write things down on paper, you can use your forms, but everyone just sits in a group together. Uh, and then uh, do a dry run where you are now moving throughout the physical space of your campus but doing so without parents and students so that you can get used to that physical, the mechanics of moving your stuff. Um, Test your process during a regular day. That's another good thing that you can do. Uh, and uh, run a full-scale exercise uh, during uh, an actual emergency drill. So Chris has already talked about what it means to uh, do uh, your uh, reunification process as part of your overall larger moulage level drill. And then the last uh, tip that I would have for sure when it comes to training is, uh, and that is redundancy. Uh, we often find really good people to work on our various emergency uh, teams. What if that person is ill or injured or they just happen to be on vacation? How are we going to replace them? So having backup people, cross-training people, uh, cross-training your attendance and reunification teams, cross-training your search and rescue and your first aid teams, uh, but make sure that you have a plan for what happens if somebody who is an integral part of your reunification process is not there, who's going to step up and take over for them? And then, frankly, when all else fails, uh, remember what is our ultimate goal here. Our ultimate goal is to safely reunite your students uh, and families. So if we achieve that goal, even if it's messy, even if it's uh, not what we wanted it to be, then we've still achieved our goal. So I find that when it comes to emergency uh, situations, you start with the very best plan you can and the best training you have. And then if at the end of the day we achieve our overarching goal, which in this case is to safely put our students back with our families, then we've achieved our goal no matter how we got there. And then we can go back afterwards and say, well, next time we would do this because we learned this important thing or we had no idea this was going to happen or we did know this was going to happen and it happened anyways uh, and make adjustments for next time. But keeping that overarching goal in the back of your head, I find, uh, encourages people and reminds us that we're all doing the best we can with what we have. In an emergency, that's really all that you can do. At this point, I want to offer up uh, the chance for you to ask questions to myself and Chris right now, uh, and then also give you two resources for asking questions after today. Uh, one is you can always send an email to schools at joffeemergencyservices.com and somebody from the school safety team will get back with you. I also welcome and invite you to email me directly if you like, and that is uh, my email, Mark M M A R C M at joffeemergencyservices.com, and I would be happy to answer your questions. And if I can't answer your question yourself, I can certainly point you in the correct uh, direction. Uh, but if you have any questions right now, go ahead and let us know. Um, otherwise, uh, you can uh, ask those questions after the fact. Uh, we're also going to, in just a second, we're going to put up a link uh, for a survey. Uh, we hope that you have found today's session to be very helpful uh, and engaging. Uh, this is, as Chris identified, part of an ongoing series around school safety. 
and uh, the more we learn from you, uh, the better this series will be. And so uh, when uh, you get that link to take the survey, please do take a few moments and do so. Your honest and candid feedback lets us know what's working well and what we can work on. Uh, Chris, that's pretty much what I've got for this morning. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our participants before we let them go? No, and, and Mark, thank you so much for, for that. The reunification process, like we said at the beginning, tends to be this difficult and fluid process, but once you've established it, and that's really the most important part, is just figuring out exactly what you want to do, and then of course figuring out a way to share that with everyone else. And once you've truly done that, you've established what your expectations are and what your parents ought to do, you're in a really good and a really comfortable space. And so we challenge you again to take the next 60 days, and even if you don't actually get the ability to practice truly in the next 60 days, that you at least have identified a plan and, and made something that either you think will work or you've vetted through a tabletop or other type of exercise and you've established will work. And again, there are schools that don't necessarily fit quite right into this plan or into this program. I have a number of schools that actually release students by bus. And so the, the, the decision has been made that the priority is actually not reunifying from campus, but the priority is how are we going to establish bus rides for students if our normal bus company isn't available. And so that's something else to think about it, is that you don't necessarily have to adhere to the sort of standard process that most schools use if there's a process or a, or a, a format that works better for you. And if you're a school that is challenged by that, then the question really comes down to more of a continuity type question, a, a business continuity. How are we going to continue to run the business part of the school, uh, which certainly does include taking care of the kids. And so uh, we invite you to join us again to hear a little bit more about the continuity side of things in an upcoming webinar. And in just a moment, I'll go over some of the upcoming webinars that we have. Um, that being said, um, again, thank you so much to everybody for being here. We're going to go ahead and chat out, it looks like it just came out to you, an invitation to be a part of a school safety assessment. And basically a school safety assessment is an opportunity for you and us to together uh, evaluate the, the process and the program that you have in place on campus. And we invite you to certainly fill out that form and one of our school safety team members will reach out to you and we'll schedule some time to sit down and talk through what you're doing. Uh, because you're on this webinar today, that assessment is actually entirely free to you. So there's no cost to it at all. And it generally takes anywhere from about 60 to 90 minutes. I, I happened to do an assessment while I was in New York yesterday. And that assessment, all told, only took about 45 minutes. But together, we were able to identify some pretty major challenges that the school has faced and start some solutions already. Um, so again, that link has been chatted out to you. We invite you to click on it and, and to join us or, or to invite us to come to campus and to look at that with you. Just a quick bit about looking ahead. Next week, we're going to be talking a little bit about preparing for lockdown. So last, not last week, but a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about lockdowns and, and about what they are and the different types of lockdowns that have really come together as school safety has evolved over the course of the last several years. And so next week, we're going to be talking about preparing for your first or, or for a lockdown drill. And November for us tends to be the first lockdown drill for most of our schools. And so as we prepare for that, uh, we want to share with you some of the key components that go along with preparing for it, both from preparing your students to preparing your staff and faculty, and believe it or not, even preparing your parents. Following that, We'll stay on the same, in the same vein and sort of in the same, using the same thread, if, if you'll allow me to use that expression. And we'll be talking about lockdown devices. So for those of you that have doors that only lock from the inside or, or don't lock from the inside, we'll talk about some of the different devices that are out there on the market that we've actually been able to get our hands on and look at. And we'll compare some of them and help you understand some that may make a lot of sense for your school. Following that, uh, now we're towards the end of October, we'll be talking about evolving with your safety plan. So safety is a dynamic and fluid concept, and it, it has to evolve and it has to shift and change with time. And so we'll talk on the 29th about some different strategies that you can use to make sure that you're staying current. As we head into the end of the year, we'll talk about immunizations, we'll talk about planning for winter break, we'll share an interesting case study where we actually had an, a high school that had a, a, an accident that occurred over winter break and really shook the school, both student, the student community as well as the, the parent community and of course staff and faculty as well. And so we'll talk a little bit about that on November 12th and the goal is to talk about it with enough time 
for you to take some specific action steps and actually implement them on your campus before winter break happens so that should an emergency happen over winter break, whether it's with a specific student or a campus-wide emergency, that you're able to really manage that emergency and, and take care of all of the elements of it that need to be managed. And then finally, the final webinar we'll do before Thanksgiving will be a, a LIFE's webinar. Um, so we'll talk about all of those things that make us itchy and scratchy, and we'll talk about some of the new policies that have come out through CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics and a couple of the other organizations that truly do lead us and, and help us establish what guidelines and best practices will look like. And so we'll share some new and exciting updates with you about that on the 19th. So if you haven't gathered this already, we find ourselves talking about relevant and exciting topics for us, and we hope that they are for you as well. And we do this every Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific or 1 p.m. Eastern. And we invite you to be a part of each of these webinars, because in each one, we, our goal is to identify a challenge, to provide some solutions that may make sense for you, to answer questions that you have around those challenges, and then to really give you some actionable steps to take back to your campus. And of course, if those steps aren't enough, or if you find yourself challenged or, or faced with unique challenges, we would love to be able to come out to your campus and, and help walk through some of those issues with you. Um, throughout this conversation, again, we've said your questions are so incredibly important to us, and it looks like there are a couple of really good questions that did come in. Um, each of these, though, has been flagged as, as a question that we'll want to follow up with you directly on. And so um, expect a phone call or an email from somebody on our school safety team in the next couple of days to help you understand and, and sort of navigate the questions that came up. With that, I'll go ahead and close out by just saying again, thank you so much for being with us on this webinar. We hope that you continue to enjoy and participate in the webinars that we do throughout this entire school year. And again, if you haven't already signed up for the entire series, please make sure you do so. And you can click the link that we'll chat out to you here in just a moment, and that'll get you registered for every Thursday at 10 a.m. And of course, if you miss any, we'll always share those by email with you afterwards so that you do have access to those um, there as well. Um, finally, that assessment link is still uh, in your chat box, so we'll give you just a moment to complete that. It looks like a couple of you have opened it. Um, so we'll give you just a moment to complete those, and then we'll let you go for the day. And again, thank you so much for being with us. And Mark, thank you so much for leading us through the conversation today. You're welcome, Chris. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it.